Welcome to EP Daily. Today on the show, we satisfy your craving for more Star Wars in the rundown. Plus, this is a bit of a stretch, but we went invisible to get a fiery look at all the things in Fantastic Four. Then our two biggest ballers have a review of the new HBO show. Also coming up, Stephen Raj, you get tactical with the Red Solstice. I get my hands on the new mobile game Phaeton and much more today on EP Daily. Brought to you by EB Games. I'm your host, Victor Lucas, bringing you the latest in everything cool every single day. Strap yourself in. I'm going to make the jump to light speed. It's time for the rundown. Netflix may be bringing audiences to a galaxy far, far away. The streaming juggernaut is rumored to be partnering with Disney to create three, yes, three live action shows set in the Star Wars universe. No official announcements have been made, but you don't have to be force sensitive to see this coming. Disney is already partnering with Netflix on Daredevil and three other upcoming Marvel shows, and the final episodes of Star Wars The Clone Wars premiered on Netflix last year. A live action Star Wars TV series was rumored to be in the works at Lucasfilm before it was bought by Disney. We'll let you know when more details come in. Disney has several different Star Wars movies on the way, the first of which, The Force Awakens, soars into theaters this December. More than a billion people have a new way to game. China is officially lifting its 15-year ban on video game consoles like the Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and the Wii U. The government began easing restrictions on the sale of consoles two years ago in Shanghai, and now the entire country can start playing. Up until now, Chinese gamers could only legally play games on the PC. This is great news for game makers given the country's huge population and publishers like Ubisoft that have already set up development studios in the country are sure to be especially happy. <laughs> Doesn't get much bigger than Star Wars in China and here to help me talk about these stories is Marissa Roberto. Thank you. Two very large things. What do you think about new live action TV shows headed well, to Netflix around Star Wars? Okay, well you and I absolutely loved Clone Wars. Like, yeah. We love everything Star Wars on Netflix already yes. so to get an OG TV show on Netflix based on Star Wars? Are you kidding me? That would be amazing. I think it'd be incredible. Yeah. And, and uh, what I've heard, and this is all speculation and rumor, but obviously all of these incredibly elaborate sets are being made for not only the uh, you know, seven, eight, and nine yeah. that are headed our way, but also the anthology films that are going to be in the in-between years. So mm -hmm. if they make the television programming it, with these sets, they're going to save a lot of money. Oh, true. And they can go and work on ancillary characters and do some backstory stuff. I think this has to happen. I think they have a lot of money, though. I oh, think they, they're going to be okay. They have a lot of money, but it okay. costs a lot of money <laughs> to do all of these effects on a regular basis every week. For sure, yes. But Netflix and Marvel, which is Disney, are mm -hmm. already in a, a great business relationship right now, and everybody yeah. seems to to be very happy so sure. this could be a, a really interesting time it's almost becoming like with all of these TVs shows and movies it's almost like the comic book rack when you walk into the comic okay. book rack and you look at all of these different titles That's an interesting comparison it's, especially get, coming from you well you get that um, much content no for sure I'm uh, I'm just excited about it because it just gives me another reason to go on to Netflix and binge something else all so right. but exciting news nonetheless as is the uh, the news of China finally opening the doors to uh, people that want to play on game consoles yeah, that's exciting. I think the challenge that they have there, though, is that consumers are really trained to play on PCs mm. in that country. And I don't know if there's going to be a great demand for the console. This will be a very interesting thing to watch. Uh, yeah, you're right. I'm wondering what the sales are going to be like. Because yeah. people that were already wanting to have the consoles clearly got them, yeah. well, illegally, but they have them. So I'm just wondering now and how I'm many sure sales they're going to have. A lot of the components, if not the entire console, was for all of these companies has been made in China for yeah. a long time. It doesn't make sense for any country to be kind of blocking off this information yeah. and this kind of entertainment from other from their population. So, yeah, so 15 years behind, but... Yeah, I applaud that that's happening, yeah. but it will be interesting to see if the market shifts in, in that massive way. Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, we have to wait and see, obviously. I'm sure there know. are people doing cartwheels and flips and <laughs> jumping for joy at uh, Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo right oh, now. Sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, right now we've got to go behind the scenes on the Fantastic Four. Reed, you're insane. Thanks. I get to take a character that everybody knows at you know a certain stage in his life, and I get to take him 20 years before. And what I really liked about Reed Richards was just his focused, hyper-intelligence. I think whenever you're the smartest person in the room, that's a great asset to have. That's a lot of power. 
And yeah, he's not trying to be the cool kid, which is nice. I've played that character in movies where you're kind of the man, you gotta worry about making jokes and make people feel good. And with Reed, all he wants to do is build this quantum gate. His parents don't really understand him. The only friend he really has is Ben. You know, Ben helps him out, but when you're that intelligent, there's few people that can understand you. Ben Grimm is a kind of atypical American teenager. I think he's someone who is in that point of his life where he doesn't know what he's gonna do next. He's about to finish high school. He doesn't have a lot of prospects. He's very average, I would say. He's, he's as average as they come. I, I think the one thing that makes him stand out, I think, is that he's very protective. He's very protective of himself. He's very protective of his friends. I want you to meet my daughter, Sue. There aren't that many women in, in superhero films, and so, you know, when one comes along, for me, because I love those kind of movies, I definitely was excited about the chance to play her. I, I was more excited about the chance to play her after hearing Josh's take on it. And I'm more interested in, in really grounded films that are super raw and, and dark. You locked the four of us away, but we're not the ones you should fear. We do it our way. What if we say no? Say yes. He doesn't take himself too seriously. You know, he's, uh, he's very passionate about his life. You know, he's, 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 opt he's, he's very, you know, optimistic. You know, he, 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 he just wants to be taken seriously, I think. He wants to be taken seriously, but he has a lighthearted nature about himself. So it's, it's kind of like a, it's a balance. You can never really have Johnny figured out, you know, because I think he's still figuring it out as he goes along. And I think that's the fun part of playing him and then, you know, having a sister and the dynamic between the four, Ben and Reed, it's a really cool dynamic to play on. This guy doesn't take orders well. Yeah, especially from people who say, I don't take orders well. No matter how elastic Reed is, no matter how much power these force fields assume, no matter how indestructible Ben is, no matter how fiery Johnny is, tragic Victor, each of them, their soul is much stronger than any of their superpowers. What you've created here is incredible. I have people fall in love with something that they didn't know they were gonna fall in love with. I think those are the best, the best ones when you just didn't know what you were gonna get. Like, wow, I wasn't expecting that, but I like it. It really felt like an experience of four individuals, young people, all going through something crazy together and finding each other and coming together, and, and that was really the heart of the, of the film. Definitely some cool effects in there. I'm still not quite convinced, though. I have to see this movie. I can't wait to see this movie. The Fantastic Four hits theaters this weekend. Put our, go to sleep. Don't go anywhere, because after the break, Scott and I learn what it means to become ballers. Football made me holy. I can't argue with that. EP's mobile coverage is brought to you by Gameloft, makers of Asphalt 8 Airborne, which you can play on your Android or iOS device for free right now. Everyone down here on Earth is counting on you. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting this guy yet, but I do know that Ernie Klein is a cool dude. Not only did he write Ready Player One, which is being turned into a movie by Steven Spielberg, but he's got a new book called Armada out that's out this summer. And to help promote it, he built his own video game, which you can download for free on the App Store. It's called Phaeton, and it's an old school space shooter, vector graphics, kind of like the old Star Wars arcade game. So immediately I was, uh -huh, oh, I gotta get this sucker, and I downloaded it, and you know what, it's really fun. You fight off endless waves of Sobrakai invaders, and the premise in this game is that it's based on a plot point in the book, an arcade game that appeared in an arcade for one day only, and then it disappeared, and it was used as a training device to bring people up to speed so that they could take on actual invaders in the book. So now I have to read the book. But the game is super fun. You've got waves of uh, enemies that come in and all kinds of different directions. It's basically you're moving the cursor around on the screen, not unlike the old Star Wars arcade game, taking out all of these ships, and then eventually, uh, occasionally, you'll see these big mother ships that stream out all kinds of other fighters that come out. You also have to shoot all of the missiles that get launched at you because they are part of the wave, and that's how you progress in the game. You gotta knock out a wave, and then a new wave will come, and they get increasingly more difficult. There's local leaderboards, or sort of friends-based leaderboards, as well as a global leaderboard, so you are gonna become addicted, and you're gonna wanna get better at this thing, and you wanna challenge your friends. Look for Batwing out there. Uh, this is a fun one. I'm gonna give it a nine out of 10.
Thanks, Vic. Another great pocket. And by the way, a little homework for you, everyone. If you haven't read it yet, go home and read Ready Player what One. A good Stephen idea. Stephen Raj, you have read it, but Marissa has not. It's on her to-do list. Okay, that's enough of that. We're moving right along to Ballers. That's right. You and I. No. Three. Boom. No, there's actually no basketball in this. It's about a show based around football. So did let's I th review this with you? You did. You were actually present for this. Let's take a look. Football made me whole. I can't argue with that. Dwayne the Rock Johnson graduated from professional wrestler to movie star, and guess what? He's back on the TV in yeah. a show called Ballers. This is on HBO. Now, if you're familiar with Entourage, which I'm sure you are, which I know you are, I am. then you will understand the genetic makeup of this show. It rolls out the same way. It's basically like Entourage, but in the sports world. I like the fact that you used the term genetic makeup because I've always wondered about the genetic makeup of Dwayne The Rock Johnson. <laughs> now, listen, I love The Rock. I like seeing him in movies. I just always felt like TV was maybe too small for him. He's yeah. a big guy. He's got a very big body, very dramatic <laughs> way about him. And I, you know, that's my question as I sit down to watch Ballers, will he be able to fit onto my TV while I'm watching <laughs> HBO? And he does fit, surprisingly he, he enough. He does fit, but there are other big guys too on the show. I mean, they're all sports guys. But I, wa I want to talk about The Rock for just one okay, more second. Sure. I really do love him. Whenever I see him in a movie, I always root for him. You guys know that I've seen him and stuff this year. There was that San Andreas movie, which was a terrible movie, but if there's a reason to see it, it's it's Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Well, I mean, we he, saw Fury 7. That was a terrible movie also, but I'm talking Dwayne The here. Rock Johnson was great in that too. Can I say a few more things? Uh, sure. He's got an amazing body and he's got an... <laughs> <laughs> he's, I think he's a great actor. He's so likable, yeah. no matter what kind of crappy material. And he had worked with a lot of crappy material when he was a wrestler. Yes. Any of this TV material, movie material, he somehow makes better. And he is the reason to watch this show. He's full of so much magnetism and personality. I love him. I cannot <laughs> take my eyes off this TV show, even if it's a little bit uh, lacking here and there. There's nothing new. I wouldn't say there's anything new and fresh here. In fact, they are using the same draw, the same pull of, you know, a lot of naked women and There is a lot of nudity on And here. money. So, like, just things, like flashy money. things. Flashy things that people are usually attracted to. So that's naked what they're using here. Naked women and money. Well, they've got naked women, money, and drugs. They've yeah. got all those naked things. Naked women, drugs, and money. I'm going to tune in and for now, the next and episode. And now social media and how social media plays an impact on, on an athlete's life. So that's pretty interesting as well. Yeah. I'm going to keep watching this thing because, you know, I support Dwayne Johnson. Yeah, you know, I, I, I feel like some of the some of the dialogue is uh, not as uh, gripping or as interesting as it should be. Yeah. But overall, I feel like this is a show, it feels fresh, like it's in Miami. We're not in LA. We're not in New York. It feels a little different. It feels like we're in some a foreign land that we don't get to see or visit that often. This is it. Listen, it's the same sponge cake, just a different flavor. So I'm going to eat it because I love sponge cake. Well, this is sponge cake. I love sponge cake. It's very right. light. Well, listen, it's very light. It's easy to digest let's, and it's sugary. Let's take that conversation up after we finish reviewing this. <laughs> you and your sponge cake. What are you going to give sponge cake out of 10? Fallers is getting a 7. All right. It's also getting a 7 from me. Ballers is currently balling on HBO right now. And up next, Stephen Raju are reunited, yes, in romantic Toronto after this. If you're like me, you used to read the old Tintin comic book graphic novels when you were a kid, or you still do, and I've always really dug this character. They made a game that was kind of tied to that as well. It's called The Secret of the Unicorn, and you get to play as Tintin and get into all kinds of madcap adventure here. You're jumping around. It's mostly a 2D platformer for big chunks of the game. It goes all over the world just like the movie does. There are some vehicle sequences in here as well. You've got all of the supporting cast of characters in there, and it has a, a visual quality that really makes it look great on the screen, you know? It really kind of ties itself to the comic panels, but also the, the look of the CG movie, which was un undeniably beautiful. Ah, oh, there you are, you little rascal. You've been chasing cats again, eh? It's nothing groundbreaking, it's nothing earth-shattering, but there aren't a whole bunch of Tin Tin experiences. It's a solid title, whether you play it on the Xbox 360 or the PlayStation 3. Hopefully this will be backwards compatible on Xbox One. There was also a pretty decent, not exactly the groundbreaking Tin Tin experience that we would all want as fans, but still pretty damn fun and a good approximation of what it must feel like to be Tin Tin himself. This is definitely a buried treasure.
Thanks, Vic. Another terrific buried treasure. Moving right along, we've got to head to Toronto. Steve and Raju are standing by. They've got a game called Red Solstice, which, weirdly enough, is also the name of an STD I had once. Just put a cream on it for a few days, it goes away. Here they are. So what's so amazing is it feels to me like it's actually been a little while since we played a video game with Space Marines. I know, man. You know what? Where did all the Space Marines Where go? All, well, today we got them. We're looking at the Red Solstice. This is on Steam. It is a tactical shooter yeah. co-op with multiplayer. And yes, yes, it Space features Marines. Space Marines with the name Red. It's on Mars. And you know what, Steve? We played a lot of these type of games. Yeah. This game was early access for a long time, and I actually think that it might have been to its detriment to a point. But first off, let's get to the basics here. What do you think of this game? Well, I'm a kind of a I'm kind of a fan of this sort of game. I mean, I like turn-based games, which this is not, but it allows you to slow down the action to a tactical view where you've got your squad of your four space marines. I think it's like Red, Biff, <laughs> Smith. Joe. The whole premise here is stuff be going down on Mars, and there's a Mars colony that's been wiped out by some weird means, and as is so often the case in these games where you're exploring a, a facility that's been overrun by some sort of malevolent force, there's audio logs giving backstory, you find out that there's like a aliens, there's a virus, I mean, there's a, we're hitting pretty much every sci-fi cliche in well, the book okay, in this, and this game. Is, I think this is one of the big problems with this game, is it's just very generic. I mean, I just didn't, you know, first off, it's pretty ugly. I don't know, I mean, it's got like that top-down view going on. If you zoom in super close, the, the guys are pretty detailed. You can't really play that way because you can't see what's going on. I thought, you know, I thought if, from a technical aspect, it was fairly polished for what it was. I mean, there's so much going on in this game. There's so many ways you can upgrade your characters. There's so many buffs they can have. There's so many like ways you can increase their weapon capabilities and all this stuff. I thought for that, it was pretty technically well done. But there's it's a little, I, little bit missing some of the special sauce. I, this is just it. Like, I mean, I think this is one of these, we've played a lot of these sort of type of games, and I just, there's very little that really distinguished this to me. I mean, other than the slow down tactical thing, which is only available in the single player, mm -hmm. because really this game is pushing you towards sort of the co op survival mode or the multiplayer. And you know what? They're all there, it's all in there, but there's just nothing that really wanted to make me go back. The story to me, I think the multiplayer version was available earlier in the early access and the single player is a thing that people have been waiting for on here and yet what did it add? It is your generic like, hey, we're on Mars, hey, stuff is going on, hey, go kill the things, oh look, there's monsters, there's monsters everywhere, go kill them. And the tutorial lasts a little long, it's really sort of tedious and then once it's... to teach you, this game is a lot to it, teach it, you. It does have, it's just fairly complex and then once it's over, I, that's when I started to enjoy myself because it's like, okay, I can do whatever I want in these yeah. levels, I can clear these guys out however I want, away we go. And yet, I found more fun into the co-op survival mode, but like I had to get my wife to play it for me, and she's <laughs> terrible. She's an awful, an awful. We don't ever play co-op with my wife. She's awful. And this is the kind of game that is fun to play with people, and then when I went to the multiplayer, the servers are pretty empty. Yeah, I didn't find it. There's like a feeling like the people who are playing multiplayer are really into it as well. Like you're not fulfilling a certain role in the squad. I dug the mechanics of the game. I really, really liked the mechanics of the game. Just the setting feels so much like those alien assault games, and I mean, they obviously spent a lot of time and thought in making it look good and making the UI good. Throw some money at some voice actors. Throw some money at a writer, you know? Throw a few thousand bucks at, at you know, you don't have to get Nolan North or, or Troy Baker, but get somebody who can emote. I mean, the, the, the characters are just so flat. And the writing, the dialogue is so bland. And they kept on yanking me out of the game. Anything that, that kind of got me into the game was yanked out the minute it's like, Okay, squad, we've got to get to the power generator to reactivate the array for the AIs. Uh, uh, duh, duh. Yeah, it's just there. <laughs> They're the bad guys. Or kill these zombie guys. Or kill these critters over here, and away you go. And I don't know. I just found a lot of it pretty pointless. I did have some fun with the survival mode. I played survival mode by myself. It's kind of like, how long can you survive? Can you survive a whole hour against all these waves? I just feel like these guys have put a lot of a lot of effort into into the mechanics, into all the underlying systems in this game, and kind of forgot that there's got to be more to actually engage people and draw them in, like in the world. I think world a little bit more character, character yeah. a little more character overall, a little more flavor. Yeah. I think is something that this thing could use. But we've had our time on Mars. <laughs> Steve, what are you gonna give the Red Solstice? You know, it's a very technically competent game, so I got to give it at least a seven out of ten. Six out of ten for me.
So Steve and Raju, just apply the cream directly to your PC for three days and uh, it'll go away. Up next, Twitter question of the day after this. If you want more EP, go to our website, epn.tv, for bonus content and full episodes. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to EP Daily. It is now time for the best part of today's show. It is the Twitter question of the day. This one comes from God for Mayor. Hey there, bud. Mm -hmm. He says, with the present surplus of TV superheroes, do we really, and then in brackets he has, did we ever mm -hmm. need the return of heroes? Oh, so cynical. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed the first season of Heroes. I thought the it was. The first season. Yeah, I thought it was. TV. Yeah, I thought it was a really cool show. Okay. I got a chance to meet the whole cast uh, at oh. Comic Con before the the premiere of the show, and I was enamored with everybody. I thought everybody was really cool and really hyped for the show. And mm -hmm. I thought the first season did a good job because it was the origin season. And then they had right. to sort of escalate and try to get everybody into this real sort of uh, intrigue that didn't quite work. Right. And they so, didn't have the effects to really pay off either. So Okay, so now they might have the effects, but they don't have the original cast. They have some of the original cast. All right. And then the they're going to introduce a whole bunch of new heroes. The concept is very analogous to the X-Men and to, right. uh, you know, people finding mutants all over the world with powers and abilities. Might. Uh, that can work for sure, but there's a lot of superheroes okay. and he's right about that. Might be overkill. Yeah, you can ask us questions and you can get caught up on full shows at EPN.TV. We've got more coming for you in the next episode of EP Daily, including a behind the scenes look at the gift. Thanks for watching. Bye. EP would like to thank its sponsors, Nintendo, Xbox. My character Simon is a guy that, that knows Gordo from high school and we got a little bit of a history together. He is a guy that I kind of knew a little bit in school and we, as the, the movie progresses, we figure out that the, the history is a little bit deeper with this guy than Simon initially discloses to his wife, Robin. That guy's odd. I think he wants to hurt us.